What if I told you that you could get OpenAI to call your code inside of your .NET application in just a few lines of code? It sounds crazy, but it's real. But first things first. My name is Spencer, and I'm the president and CTO of Averon Software. And AI is everywhere, of course. As a developer, it's sort of unavoidable to hear, well, are you doing AI yet? Or what are you doing with AI? Or how are you integrating OpenAI into your application? So my goal today is to show you Semantic Kernel to show you how you can get OpenAI to call functions within your .NET app. It's super simple to do and requires just a little bit of code. So I want to walk you through everything. So if you've seen my previous video, you'll see that OpenAI, of course, and Azure OpenAI, they have their own libraries for uh, interacting with the chat completion API, which are super helpful and great, but I don't use them directly. I actually use Semantic Kernel. First thing I want to do is walk through uh, an example application that I've created using Semantic Kernel. So what I did was I created just a chat bot that you could go back and forth with. So if I play it here on the screen, say something to OpenAI, AI and book your restaurant. We'll worry about that here in a second. I'm just gonna say hello. Hello. -oh. Hello, how can I assist you with your restaurant reservation today? What restaurants can I go to? I can help you with finding a restaurant. Could you please provide more details such as your location, the type of cuisine you're interested in, and so on and so forth. We're just kind of interacting with what I'll just call ChatGPT for now. And we've basically just told it, you're a helpful restaurant reservation booking assistant. So ChatGPT, of course, doesn't have access to book any kind of reservation. But let's say you had a system that allowed your users to book restaurant reservations. And you as a developer were asked to make a way, a chatbot for your users to use natural language to book those reservations. So I wanna show you how to do it with Semantic Kernel. But first, let's go over the uh, code that we have written so far. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this. First things first, of course, we have our open API, AI API key uh, that I requested. Uh, and you can see how to do that in my previous video about using OpenAI. And then I've defined the model. We're just gonna use GPT-40, which is very good. Uh, and then we're gonna get to the actual semantic kernel part of the code. So semantic kernel builder is the first thing we're gonna do. So you see that we have this kernel.create builder. And that's basically kind of like uh, when you're, if you're an ASP.NET Core developer and you're building your app, you know, you add your services and then you create the app, you add the services you need to that app, and then you call build to actually get the thing that actually does the thing, right? In this case, what we've done is created a builder that simply adding OpenAI chat completion, and you can use Azure OpenAI, you, you can see that semantic kernel builder dot add Azure OpenAI chat completion is here. And there's exposure to other models uh, such as Mistral, uh, there's libraries for those. They're not as well supported. They usually lag behind a little bit and that's because OpenAI is kind of the dominant player in the landscape right now, but they are available if you do use them. And then we're gonna just call build and semantic kernel, and we are gonna get what's called a, I'm gonna go ahead and type it out for you, kernel object. So this kernel object is kind of the thing that contains all of the semantic kernel uh, goodness. And just another couple of differences from the previous uh, video, instead of a list of chat messages, we actually now have this thing called a chat history. This is the object that is going to contain all of our chat history. It's just held in memory. It doesn't have a persistence layer other than uh, in memory while the, sh while the application is running. You'll notice here as well that we get our semantic kernel. So semantic kernel does have a dependency injection system built within it. So you'll see that get required service. Uh, we have an I chat completion service. So you can see that within Semantic Kernel, it does in fact have a dependency injection system, which we'll talk a bit more about later. We talked about chat history. And then of course, we just have our while loop that reads the input from the user. If they say exit, we'll break out of the loop and exit the application. But otherwise, we are going to go to chat history and we're gonna say add chat message content. So it does have this uh, add method. And you'll notice that chat message content, it looks a little different. In the previous video, we did add user content or something along those lines. Uh, in this case, you have chat message content and you see that there is this author role object that is used to define different personas that can interact with the chat completion API. In this case, this is the user. And then we're going to actually make the call out to get the chat message content. So this is actually gonna do our chat completion. So 
unlike in the previous video where we actually said user message content or something along those lines and instantiated those, we actually just use the chat message content object and then we say author role dot user. Uh, this will have user assistant system depending on the author role that uh, is required that you're adding to your history. And then of course the actual line. And then we'll get the response from the API. So you'll see await chat client dot get chat message contents async. We will get that last chat response and then write it to the console. And then of course we will also add it to our chat history. Add, and we'll say chat response, boom. So that way it can persist and we can keep these uh, messages flowing. So these messages can be continue to be sent to the API with each chat completion request. So this is all cool and good, pretty expected. Um, but how is this useful? This is a lot more lines of code for doing what essentially is the same thing. And that's where semantic kernel gets really interesting because now we can define a class, we can code in C sharp using, using the skills that we already have and make semantic kernel aware that this is code that we wanna make available to open AI. So let me show you what that looks like. So we're gonna define what's called a plugin. So I'm gonna go right clicking in JetBrains Writer, of course, the best .NET IDE in the world, add class interface, and I'm just gonna call it the restaurant booking plugin. Do I want to add it to Git? Yes, I do. So we got our restaurant booking plugin. So I'm going to go ahead and start by defining a very, very simple function. I'm going to call it public string get restaurants available to book. So we'll just pick a few of my favorites. So we'll return in here, get that, and then we will say McDonald's, don't judge me. Five guys, apparently they take reservations now. And then, uh, oh, we'll pick a new, we'll pick a good one. Let's see, Chili's is pretty decent. And then uh, Ruth's Chris, if you're getting really fancy. And so that's enough for now. So you see that we've defined a restaurant booking plugin and this was a real restaurant booking system. We're probably looking this up inside of a database using the user's location or something along those lines. We're gonna call it get restaurants available to book and define it in our plugin. So pretty cool, but how do you actually use it? Right? So there's just a few things that we need to do to get this to work. And I'm gonna show you all the ways that it goes wrong. So first things first, we're gonna go here to our semantic kernel builder and we're gonna say semantic kernel builder dot plugins dot add from object. And we're gonna say new restaurant booking plugin. Okay. And then uh, we're gonna run it and see what happens. Oh, we are gonna see that the intro to semantic kernel restaurant booking plugin doesn't implement any kernel function attributed methods. So we're gonna switch back to it and I'm gonna show you the first thing that we need to define. So we need to actually tell semantic kernel what methods are available because this class might be a class that has a lot of different things. And we wanna really define, be really specific about the methods that we want to expose out to OpenAI. So to that end, we will use the kernel function attribute, which is available under microsoft.semantic-kernel namespace. And you can see that, of course, Ryder brings it in for me automatically. Good job, Ryder. So we got our kernel function, and that's really the bare minimum to define the function that is. So let's go here. We're gonna say, say something to OpenAI and book your restaurant. And our hope is that it will call this restaurant booking plugin here and get our list of restaurants. So we're gonna say, Give me a list of restaurants available to book. And we're gonna see that, what's your location and what kind of cuisine do you want? Not really helpful, we're, we're an internal system. So this is ChatGPT doing what ChatGPT does best, which is just reaching into a knowledge base. But we really want it to call this function. So there's just a couple of things that we need to do. First things first, we're gonna go ahead and stop our solution. And we're gonna scroll down here and we're gonna look a little bit more closely at this chat history and we're at get chat message contents async. And you can see that it takes in a couple more arguments that we're gonna to use to leverage to get it to actually call our plugin. So we're gonna see prompt execution settings, execution settings equals null, and the, it'll take in a kernel object as well. So we're gonna go ahead and give it a new OpenAI prompt execution settings. And I'm just gonna set the property of function choice behavior to be function choice behavior dot auto. This is the object that uh, is used to configure all sorts of different things. You can change behaviors of open AI based on your needs. Like you can set the temperature for instance, but we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna leave it as is. And we're gonna go on and we're gonna hit play and we're gonna see what happens. 
Say something to OpenAI and book a restaurant. I think I will. What restaurants are available to book? And we're gonna see we get another exception, which is totally fine, which is that auto invocation is not supported when no kernel is provided. So even though we created our chat completion service from our semantic kernel instance, we still do have to pass in the kernel uh, in order for it to know what functions to invoke. So we're gonna go ahead and do that here. We're gonna pass in our semantic kernel object here. We're gonna hit play. And our hope is now that it calls this function and says get restaurants available to book. So what restaurants are available to book? The restaurants available to book are McDonald's, Five Guys, Chili's, and Ruth's Chris. Okay, that's pretty cool. So now let's break down what just happened. We sent a message over to chat GPT. We sent it over to OpenAI's API to say, hey, process this message. In addition, we sent it all sorts of what are called tools. And these tools can be defined either in our API call or in this case by the, our abstraction, which is semantic kernel, kind of does all the heavy lifting for us. Finally, ChatGPT and OpenAI are recognizing that actually this user's request matches a function uh, that they've defined and sent my way. So I'm gonna go ahead and issue a call back. And semantic kernel is going to automate the taking of that response that raw response from OpenAI and actually calling the function. So this is actually using the tools parameter here of the OpenAI chat completions API. And you can see that they give it the type of tool, which is only function, and then the function itself. So a function is made up of a description, a name, and the parameters, which is JSON schema, and whether or not they should strictly adhere to parameters, the shape of the parameters that are being called. Cool thing is, is as opposed to writing all the code yourself to actually make this work, Semantic Kernel just does it all for you, which is awesome. So in this video, we just scratched the surface. We just started down the path of actually using Semantic Kernel to expose our code, our real code to OpenAI to call for itself. You can think of our restaurant booking plugin like an interface, right, in C-sharp. We're only exposing this little bit to OpenAI, but that gives us a huge amount of power because now we can leverage OpenAI and other LLMs to allow us to use natural language to actually interact with our systems and really create an agentic system for our application. So in the next video, we're gonna dive deeper into building plugins, including some best practices that I've learned for building real plugins for clients. As always, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Please comment below with questions, thoughts, and are you building agentic AI systems? Have you used Semantic Kernel? If so, what are your thoughts? If not, what are you waiting for? I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks.